Yay. You're muted, Tony. Special guests are awesome. I know, right? We should do this more often. Hey, Sandy, how's it going? It's going great. How are you, Fraser? Good. I, I love all the toys in the background there. What's going on there? So I am reporting live today from the Lunar and Planetary Institute Library in Houston, Texas, down by Johnson Space Center. That is awesome. Oh, man. So what, like, what have you got back there? You've got like a bunch of... like. There's a bunch of uh, stuffed planets. There's a bunch of globes. I grabbed an asteroid since I forgot my 3D printed one in the car. And we also have a little Mars rover made out of Legos, Lego bricks, excuse me. That and is earlier awesome. today I got to see a Saturn V, and I got to see the mission control room, the old mission control room, and I got to handle a Martian meteorite and a Vesta meteorite, and I got to see a bunch of Apollo samples. So it's been a really good day so far. Have you been there before? No, this is my first time. Have you been here? No. I have. Have you? Yeah. Mm, I and was it really that. awesome, Pamela? It really was. And they also, like, it's not just that they have awesome stuff, but they're really nice people because, like, I had a piece of broken equipment and someone just fixed it for me. So it's like they have all the cool toys in the world and all the nice people. All right. Well, <laughs> all these, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Paul Abel gave me the tour and he's the best. Oh, that's so great. Um, right, so uh, for people who are wondering like, what on earth they've stumbled into here, this is going to be our uh, live episode of Astronomy Cast, uh, and we're going to be doing episode 341, and now you're wondering what happened to 340, which is the Werner von Braun episode. Um, that's going to happen after this. We sort of we wanted to make sure we could sort of stick to Sandy's schedule, and so we're going to record that episode with her, and then we're going to probably sort of shut things back down, and then start up again and do the the three forty episode, and then hopefully we'll be all caught up. Um, so uh, we're going to record like as usual, we'll record a live episode. We'll take about twenty seven minutes or so, but this time we've got a special guest, which is great. So we're going to be talking to Sandy and introducing her and. And we will sort of go through that. And then Sonny's going to report on a bunch of cool stuff that happened at the 45th uh, LPSC conference in Texas. Um, now, as always, you can interact with us. You can ask us any questions you want. And the way to do that is to use the Q&A app. Um, uh, there we go. So we got Guido Bibra has said, uh, yay, hello, Pamela Fraser and Sandy. And we've got uh, hello from Ira from Tony Lynch. I'm watching the Red Sox versus the Orioles while I'm waiting. So uh, I'm not sure whether we're honored or that's good. Um, okay, so uh, are you guys ready to ready to roll? Let's yeah. do it. Okay, cool. Um, and I will get my intro going. Um, now, for recording purposes, we're going to, Pamela are going to be using our versions of the recording, but we're going to have to pull your, probably going to have to pull the audio for this episode off the YouTube recording. So it probably doesn't matter um, to, to keep a local version, because no one's recording Sony's audio, right? Okay, so don't record in GarageBand? You can if you want, and then we can sort of, and then we can give that all to Preston, he can include that for our versions of the audio. Okay. Let's yeah. Might as well. Yeah. Um, I don't think Sandy's got. Do uh, we want Sandy to use the studio setting in in Hangouts? Ooh. Hmm. Because that really uh, does sound better. Well, what can I do to help you out? Uh, yeah. Why don't we? You uh, you could try that. Sure. Uh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> um. So <laughs> click on the settings. Helpful. Yeah. Uh, click on the settings. Is that Hangout Toolbox? Oh, no, that's the settings. No, button. just the settings in the top, like right beside the Hangout button. And there's and, and then there's a little drop down that says voice and then below if you it says studio. like studio yeah and if you switch to studio should we all just switch to studio Whoa. and then all right Ooh. let's see i'm not sure if it's going to work this is this is engineering in progress folks yeah and you instantly sound so much better does it sound better now oh well, you yeah you sound different yeah it it should sound much better okay all right uh, it probably won't make a big difference for Sandy's version because I think you're just using your your little lapel mic, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, hey everybody, you get it in studio mode. All the bass. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's. Oh, I'm, I'm getting some echo though. Yeah, I am too. Okay. Let's nope. only do studio for Sandy. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, we'll sit here, test, here test. and pat the rover. 
<laughs> test, test, test. No, I'm still getting echo. Hello? Yeah, can you turn off the studio mode, Sonny? Sorry, sure. everybody. Anything for you. Mm hmm. Dig a hole, fill it back in. All right. All right. Testing. Okay, I don't hear any echo. Okay, I think it'll be fine. No, you know what? So what if it doesn't sound like our usual studio quality? It's totally fine. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I am still going to... No, you know what? I'm not going to press record. We're just going to let YouTube handle this. And if it doesn't work, then there never was a 341. We've done that before. It's, it's happened. Um, okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 341. The 45th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference with Sandy Springman. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. P Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest, and our special guest star, Sandy Springman, from the Arecibo Observatory. Hello, Pamela. Hello, and, and welcome, Sandy. It's great to have you on, finally. I'm, I'm as pleased as punch to be here. Awesome. So who are you and what do you do, Sandy? I work at Arecibo Observatory. We find asteroids before they find us. So my job is Junior Planetary Defender and Space Rock Zapper. Which is, is that your honest title? Are you like really a space, a, a, a Earth Defender? I wish. Do you have business I cards with that? Um, my business card right now says Asteroid Radar Astronomer and Writer. But on LinkedIn, I think it says Junior Planetary Defender and Space Rock That's Blaster. Awesome. Hmm. Which is what my office mate has as well. So when he, I guess now that he's a research scientist, he's just a space rock blaster. Yeah, I think you need to lose the junior and just switch to space rock blaster. Let's and that's really just a glorified way of saying data analyst, analyst and observing support. So what we do is we have the world's most powerful planetary radar system in our backyard. We have a 1,000-foot diameter, that's 305-meter for our metric friends, telescope. It sits in a giant sinkhole in the hills at the observatory and we send radio waves out to asteroids and they bounce off. So most astronomy is done and you rely on the benevolence of the universe for your photons, for your signal. Radar says, nope, we are going to create our own signal, we're going to bounce it off asteroids and see what we get back. That's what we do all day. It's great fun when the system works and the system is not working right now, but it hopefully it'll be up and running again. Yes, right. You guys had an earthquake a couple of We had an earthquake ago, right? and it damaged one of the cables. I'm almost oh, no. done with the post about that for the Planetary Society. The long and short of it is the telescope was down for two months. And usually when the telescope's down, whether due to a painting project or something else, you can usually work on things. But because there was actual damage to the support system of the telescope, no one could go up and do non-essential work on the telescope. So we couldn't do regular maintenance. So a lot of things that would have gotten looked at or repaired during a downtime did not get worked on. So they're trying to catch up on that. Right now they're plugging water leaks in the system because we cool our transmitters with 300 gallons a minute of deionized water and you plug one leak and then you find another leak somewhere else. And so you're 500 feet up in the air and trying to diagnose water leaks and I, I hear it's not a lot of fun. But someone's got to do it. You've got to find those asteroids. Before they find us. Which they do occasionally. Um, so now the sort of purpose of this show is that you're going to be talking, well, the original plan speaking for this episode. Of, speaking of asteroids finding out, this is, <laughs> is the piece of Chelyabinsk. Can everyone see this? Yeah. This is in Soviet Russia, meteorite find you. So this is the thing that hit Russia last February and made a lot of people very sad when it knocked out their windows. So sometimes they do find us, but our goal is to find the really big ones before they would hurt anyone seriously. That is so cool. Um, so, right, so the original, when we had originally planned out the show, Pamela was going to be attending the 45th LPSC conference. This is the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. Did I get that right? You got it. Soci okay. In uh, Texas. And, uh, but then because Pamela's schedule is always bananas. Uh, it had nothing to do with my schedule. Got I got pneumonia. <laughs> Pneumonia schedule. I laugh. I'm sorry, Pamela. I'm really glad you're better nothing's, now. Nothing's nothing's funnier than pneumonia. Um, <laughs> it's funny. no, 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 no. What's less funny than pneumonia is a number of people got something bacterial nasty after the conference. So, so I'm glad I didn't. Con crud. So, uh, right, and so originally Pamela's going to go to this, and then Pamela couldn't uh, couldn't 
couldn't make it because she was sick. And so uh, we thought, but Sonny did make it. And yes. so we thought we would pick Sonny's brain and find out what interesting things happened. And what's great about this is that a lot of the stuff that she got a chance to see never had a proper you know, press release never really made it outside the conference itself, and so you're not going to hear a lot of the news that that this the stuff that gets announced there, which is great. Um, so I, that's one of the reasons I really enjoy these conferences is is there's so much stuff that's sort of under the surface. So now you have sort of given us a big list of of topics, and I'm going to let you go wherever you want, Sandy, and pick whatever you want to talk about. Which All one? right, well, let's start with Edgar Rivera Valentin's abstract, he was talking about Iapetus, which is that yin-yang moon of Saturn. It's the one that's got a dark section and a light section, and it's got an equatorial ridge, like a walnut. And it looks sort of like a larger version of this asteroid, without the moon. Ed, Ed who's hilarious, and he's on Twitter, his handle is Planet Trekkie. He just, he's great. You should follow him, because he's very sassy. He wanted to see if the Nice model would prohibit this ridge on Iapetus. So there's some discussion of how this ridge on Iapetus formed, but if the Nice model Explain comes the along, Nice model, oh, the nice model in, in, in the non-dynamicist answer is that once upon a time the solar system was in a slightly different configuration than how it is now. And Jupiter and Saturn had this migration in towards the Sun, then out planets switch places. And when planets start switching places and moving, they excite all the little things in the solar system. So the Kuiper Belt, all these asteroids got kicked out, they got relocated, and in the process it created something called the Late Heavy Bombardment. And that sounds really bad. If you're hearing heavy and bombardment and you're a small planet, life is really going to suck because you're going to be hit by all of these things. So Ed pretty much went out and said, how much would it suck to be Iapetus during this late heavy bombardment? And if the late heavy bombardment was really heavy, would it ruin this ridge on Iapetus, according to this idea that these planets migrated? And Ed found out, yes, the late heavy bombardment was a little too heavy for Iapetus. So perhaps the Nice model needs to be changed. There's some different parameters. Maybe there were fewer things in the outer solar system potentially hitting Iapetus. And what was really fun during this session it was I was also following along on Twitter. I was live tweeting this talk, and some people were asking questions. So someone asked, which Nice model did Ed use? So I got up to the microphone and said, Ed, this is a question from the Away team on Twitter. Which Nice model did you use? And Ed answered it, and I typed out an answer. And so even Bill Botke, who's a dynamicist, he thought this was the best thing ever, that we're using new media to ask questions during talks and answer things and to broadcast this out to a larger audience. Well, I think, you know, it's the future, right? I mean, a lot of these people don't realize how much this science has a, a, a real interest outside of just the conference itself, that there's so many people that, that would love to see and participate in this. I mean, we used to... Uh, uh, live broadcast a lot of stuff happening in the AAS meetings, and there was you know great interest in that. So in conclusion, aside from that social media and Twitter are great things, it's pretty much that um, this ridge on Iapetus is maybe younger than the late heavy bombardment, um, because the late heavy bombardment would have erased this ridge if it was old. Um, maybe it didn't record craters until after the late heavy bombardment, maybe it was just sort of this warm, icy thing, sludgy thing rather than ice. Or maybe there are fewer small bodies in the outer solar system to get excited during the late heavy bombardment. And or maybe these satellites are really young, they didn't form early in the solar system, and so maybe something else went on in the Saturn system. So as my uh, college planetary science professor would say, astronomers' hands wave wildly. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, keep going. More. What's next? All right. So my good friend and fairy god astronomer, as I refer to him, Andy Rivkin. He's A.S. Rivkin on Twitter. And Andy is a great guy. He did a couple of things at this meeting. So the cool thing about LPSC is you can submit multiple abstracts. So he had one on Vesta, and he also had one on Ceres. Ceres is the largest dwarf planet. It was discovered on New Year's 1801, I want to say. And it's a large asteroid in the outer asteroid belt. It's a minor planet at this point in our classification scheme. But and it was actually called a planet when it was first found. So Pluto is not the first object to be demoted. And, and so 
Pluto and Ceres are the only things to have been caused a, called a planet and not visited by a U.S. spacecraft, and both will be visited in 2015. So anything in our solar system ever called a planet will have been visited by the end of 2015. And so the other thing is that Andy Rifkin is a huge baseball fan, so you can make all sorts of World Series jokes around him, and he loves them, I think. Anyway, sorry non-sports ball people. Most asteroids that are big have collisional families. So how does a family form? Asteroid families have very dysfunctional starts. You have a big asteroid and gets hit by a little asteroid, and the big asteroid knocks into smaller pieces. Or if you're Vesta, you have something knock off a sizable chunk of your part of you and you create a 10-kilometer crater, and all these pieces go scattering out into the asteroid belt, and some of them even fall to Earth. So today at NASA Johnson, I got to hold a piece of what people are pretty sure is the mantle of Vesta. It's diogenite. It's green olivine crystals, which is super cool. So if you've been to Hawaii, if you've been to volcanic portions of New Mexico, Arizona, and really, really pretty much any other volcano on Earth, you'll see olivine crystals, diogenite crystals, which are brought up from the mantle by volcanoes. So we assume that Vesta was pretty volcanic. It separated into a crust, a mantle, and a core and that this mantle that's got sampled by something hitting chunks off of it, uh, chunks of it have come down to Earth as meteorites. We don't see meteorites from Ceres, and we don't see a Ceres family. So we don't see chunks of Ceres that have been kicked off and gone into the asteroid belt. So there's some discussion as to why there aren't, there isn't a Ceres family. So this is a pretty big asteroid. We assume things have been hitting it for a while. Chunks have gotten knocked off of it. We even have meteorites from Mars. There's speculation about meteorites from Mercury. Why not Ceres? And the idea is that Ceres is really icy. Every once in a while, someone will come out and say that Ceres is actually a refugee from the Kuiper belt, that it is a thing, something from the outer solar system that got knocked inward, but it didn't necessarily form in the asteroid belt. Whether or not you believe that, Ceres does have ice. So Andy Rivkin and his co-authors put out that Series chunks from Ceres have been knocked off, but because they're so icy, the ice sublimates off, and so the, the inherent Ceres signature has just been wiped away. It's been erased. So there might be a Ceres family in the asteroid belt, but we can't associate it with Ceres because any signature has just evaporated, has sublimed. And I know they've seen... Um geysers on Ceres. Yeah, which... so there's a lot. Ceres has, a, has an active surface. It's not just a dead world. Things are going on there. So there might be other processes at work that have changed the surface of Ceres in comparison to the proper, surface properties of what could it be its dynamical family. It's pretty ironic, or I guess fortuitous, that one of the most interesting bodies in the solar system will happen to have a mission visiting it in a year. A I, I think that counts as very well planned on the part of, of, of NASA and the European Space Agency because th this is a, a case of they quite purposely wanted to just wanted to explore two asteroids that were representative of the two different geophysical families uh, in terms of where they are uh, compared to the ice line in the asteroid belt. And going to two of the largest of each each family was really a great way to get great data and figure out just what geophysics is possible in the asteroid belt. Well, do you typically see this like a flurry of science on an object that's going to be visited, like you know, before oh, yeah. Messenger arrived at Mercury? I guess because there's all this focus in trying to sort of almost do the pre-science, like you're trying to figure out what questions you want to ask, and then so that when the spacecraft gets there, you can do as much get as much data as you as you can. Right. And I mean, the other thing with space exploration is you plan your measurements, you plan to see this and you plan to see that, but you know you're going to be surprised all the time. And there's a lot of things that you'll just serendipitously observe. So much of what we know about the solar system has just been discovered by accident in the course of sending spacecraft past objects. So, for instance, discovering that asteroids had moons when Galileo went past the asteroid, it was an absolute accident yeah. that someone was processing the image and discovered, hey, this asteroid Ida it has a moonlet. So, and thus we have Dactyl. Yay, Dactyl is adorable. It's, my, it's one of my favorite moonlets. Um, okay, well, let's move on. What else? Um, so, the wonderful Sarah Matson has been, she's a researcher at the University of Arizona, and she works for HiRISE, which is a half-meter-ish telescope in orbit around Mars, and it looks out at Mars, and you can actually request images on Mars. And it's pretty cool, because 
high rise has really showed that Mars is an active planet, which I think is is just super neat, and that all these things keep going on. You have landslides, you have these wind effects, and that life on, if, well, not life, but Mars itself is really a world. It's not just a dead thing. So this is sort of the theme here. And that you see lots of, uh, you see these pits opening up in the north polar layer deposits. There was a photo that made it around recently. Um, I think it was APOT, or the high-rise selection of some of these, uh, that terrain sort of looks like a labyrinth. And that you get these, uh, that the winds come off the North Pole, they cause these uh, sublimation, and you get these interesting pits opening up. So really, it's uh, Mars is really a planet in motion, and that the uh, wind action, some sort of wind is probably responsible for creating these pits, and uh, there's might be, yeah. So, and you'll, you know, as, as seasons change on Mars, you'll be able to investigate these things further, but the fact uh, that you can actually do this and start doing sort of Time, time scale geology on Mars remotely is just incredible. I mean, this is really a testament to the the resolution of this of this telescope, really, on yeah. this on the spacecraft, and the fact that it's imaged so much of the planet that you're now getting a chance to come back and take a look at these regions again and again, year after year, and really start to see these, as you said, you know, boulders rolling down hills. You're seeing um, you're seeing fresh gullies being created. You're seeing dust devil tracks along the surface of, of and Mars. it's not just it's not just cratering. It's actually wind. It's this and you know, it's, it's things that are intrinsic to the planet. They're not just stuff from space hitting it, which I just think is so cool. And, and this particular discovery highlights the High Wish program where anyone can put in and say, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if, mm. and put in suggestions to direct the mission, and this is a no PhD required awesome bit of science. And I, I'm really intrigued to see how far this will go as missions last long enough that the people who built the mission start to rel relinquish control and let other people with amazing science step forward and say, can we look for this? Right. And, you know, the other cool thing about this is that Sarah, she doesn't have a PhD. She's been working in this office for a while and that, you know, really good science happens from people regardless of a certain piece of paper they have. And you can follow Sarah on Twitter. She's Art Math Girl. And she also has two kittens that fell out of the ceiling of the Mars office there last year. And their names are Phobos and Deimos. Right. So, <clears throat> As part of the uh, Sandy kitten replacement? I had, I had nothing to do with these cats, but they're on Twitter. They're ceiling cats. So I think Sarah is pretty awesome. Not only because she has cats, but because she studies Mars and shows that Mars is really this dynamically interesting place. Fantastic. All right, move on. on. What's next? All right, um, let's, so we've talked about Ceres, we talked about, uh, let's talk about the throat of Kraken. The what what now? The throat of Kraken, we're not talking about rum, we're not talking about giant cephalopods, yeah. we're talking about Titan C. So I um, got suckered into learning how to sail when I was about 11, and then I got volunteered to teach sailing at the sailing club when I was 16, and then somehow I wound up on the board of a sailing club when I was 24, 25. And so I really like boats. I really like seas. I really like sailing. And the fact that we're starting to see on Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, tides. And that you're starting to see that these, these seas might have waves. You might actually have some, you know, you're starting to see Titan as a planet, as a world. Not just a moon, but as a, as a world. And they're actual processes going on there, which I think is super neat. So the person who works on this, his name is Ralph Florence, and Ralph is great because he does all sorts of field work. He did something on the rocks at Racetrack in Death Valley. There are these rocks that move mysteriously. But when you're talking about Titan, he's been publishing work on Tides and Titan. He's been publishing in ocean engineering journals. This is very interdisciplinary work. So it's sort of interesting to see what sort of tidal amplitudes you're seeing, um, what the height of tides. It's not a resonant basin like in the Bay of Fundy in Maine and Canada, but there's other things that work on Titan to affect tidal heights. No, it's all so, mixed so up, right? It's all backwards, right? The, that here on Earth, the tides are caused by the moon. <laughs> right, right. On, on, on Earth and on Titan, it's all reversed, right? The tides are caused by Saturn Water. pulling on ammonia and methane on Titan, right? Yeah. 
And, and for people who don't know what Resonant Tides or the Bay of Fundy is, why don't you go okay, ahead and explain okay. so that? If you've ever been up to uh, Maine or northeastern Canada, there's this t uh, bay and it's super narrow and you get, not necessarily narrow, but you get these tide changes, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 it's, feet. It's northern Nova Scotia and Nord there's, yeah. there's some amazing photographs where you see the tide goes all the way out and it dries the bay. It suddenly looks like a surface of alien world. I'll see if I can post some photos later. And, and then, then when the tide comes back in, in some places streams that are trying to, to drain into this, this inlet reverse direction. Um, you get the water goes up 30 feet. It's, it's one of the most amazing sets of um, well, reactions to the changes in the tide that we have on the surface of the But Earth. I'm at about the same level, same latitude as the Bay of Fundy, so but it doesn't but we don't have, have tides. Right, it doesn't have anything kind of to do with latitude. Right. It has to do with the geography of the, the floor in that area and how the water is forced to funnel. So the thing that Ralph Lorenz is finding on Titan is that there might be tidal amplitudes of 4 meters, which, you know, that's, you know, over 12 feet. Whereas in Puerto Rico, where I live, we maybe get amplitudes of a meter, a half meter. It's not very much. So that on Titan, you're getting more extreme tides than where I've been living for the last year and a half, and that the tides flow at a half meter per second. That's serious business. So if you're ever going to land the Titan Mare Explorer, which is a boat that would go sailing on the seas of Titan, which so doesn't look cool. like... If this ever happens, which I'm going to do whatever I can in my power to ensure it does, and launching in late 20s, getting there in 2040... Long game, Sandy. Long game is that you yeah. really have to take these things into consideration when you're planning a space mission to go sailing on the seas of Titan. And I'm just going to keep saying sailing on the seas of Titan until you bring out the hook or tell me to move on. So I think that's pretty cool. And you can get depths of these basins and channels on Titan doing bathymetry. So you can time how long it takes for a radar pulse to go through the liquid and come back. And based on the timing and based on the attenuation, how much the signal goes down, you can get an idea of how deep these bodies of water are on Titan. How, how deep are they? Um, oh, gosh. To I the nearest thousand meters, oh, you know. Don't... Are they shallow or are they deep? Um, they're, well, I can tell you they're about, they're 13 kilometers wide, they're 40 kilometers long, um, and I don't have... I don't have Welcome their depth. Welcome to Pamela's world. Yeah. Oh, well, I can hey, find you know, it. Preston, I can Preston, can, Preston can edit that out. We'll give you a second to find the answer if you know where it is. Um, Do you know where it is, Pamela? Do you know the answer to that question? Let me let me look this up. Because I Lakes of Titan. Okay, so they have a maximum depth of about 3 to 7 meters. So you have tides that are about on order of how deep these seas, seas are or even, or even deeper, more. So there could be parts of Titan that are getting dry. Wow. Right? And then, I know this and then is just wild. Building back up and moving around. It's just crazy. Uh, okay, let's move on. I think we've got time for one last piece of science. Have you got you've got one more? I've got a piece of almost science. Um, so not we don't just talk about science at these conferences. We also talk about outreach. How do you educate people about the work you do? Why solar system science is so cool? Why our work is really fantastic and exciting? And it's not just going into classrooms, which is important work, and it's not just teaching, it's not just Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops, it's also reaching out to adult communities who might not just be the interested public. So a lot of what we do most of the time is talking to people who are generally interested in space. So at the University of Arizona, there's a grad student, Jamie Villaro, and she's been doing an art show for last year, and she's going to do it again this year, where they bring together art and science communities to talk to the public about science. So they get local artists, they actually get faculty to present their art in an art show at the university and everyone's art who gets submitted, everyone who submits art, their art gets selected and art can be for sale. And it's very neat to see some of the art pieces. And if you look at the Lunar and Planetary Lab grad skits in the fall, there's a skit involving the department chair telling someone to go steal a piece of art. So it's, it's, it's very engaging and some of the professors are quite accomplished artists which is, you know, it's, it's not, and so this is an event geared towards everyone in the community who might not be a space nut, but who likes art, and maybe they can learn some planetary science in the process. 
That is really cool. I, before we wrap this up, I'd love to get some sort of uh, sort of your insights about what it's like to actually attend some of these conferences. Like, you know, how do you how do you feel like if a person's just getting into their career, they're getting in, you know, they're going to school, how important is it for them to attend these kinds of conferences? I think these meetings are great because you can learn a lot of science, but most importantly, you can meet the people who do the science. And if you are interested in working with people, you can get to meet them. You can see, do I actually want to work with this person? Or is there maybe someone else they can recommend working with? But also, you can ask people questions. When I first went to this meeting three years ago, I was writing my master's thesis. And I chased someone down, and I sat down with him for 30 minutes and asked him a whole bunch of questions about his work, since my work was expanding on his. And it was a really great opportunity to sort of pick his brain in person get some figures from him that I could use in my thesis and sort of contextualize my work. Um, so that was, that was super nice. And then also, I know a lot of people at these meetings, sometimes if someone's hiring for a position, they'll do interviews at these meetings. And I also like it because I get to meet people who I've never met before. I get to make friends in the Mars community. There's not a lot of natural overlap with what I do and the Mars community. So being able to meet Martians or people who want to go sailing on the seas of Titan is really great. And as you can tell, I get really excited about sailing on the seas of Titan. So even though I'm not a Titan person, maybe I'll try to become one as my life goes on. And sailing would be very cool. Right. Once they, they got your attention when they said sailing. <laughs> and, and beyond this, what, what's really amazing is how it can open doors. I remember the, the very first... Uh, time I went to LPSC back in, I guess it was March of 2003, I ran across a very young undergraduate, I think she was a freshman at the time, Carrie Bean. And <laughs> she was presenting her research, she uh, was sitting there at one point wearing the medals she'd won at space camp because that was still exciting. She was probably like all of 17 or 18. And over the years she's gotten to know people in the entire field of planetary science and now I believe she's part of the Mars Curiosity team and um, she's now working on Dawn which is heading yeah to that's right she's going to Dawn um, on from Mars she's come in a little closer to the asteroid belt yeah so okay. so she's gotten to advance her career by going to these meetings basically as a baby scientist and growing up in front of all of us I mean this is how I got my current job at Arecibo I met my current boss at this meeting three years ago, and he had remembered me from when I had applied for a summer internship at Arecibo and didn't get it. And so a year and a half after my first LPSC, I finally got the job at Arecibo. So being able to meet people in person is, is huge. And as meetings go, it's not terribly expensive. Right. The registration fee is pretty low. There are a lot of area hotels and a lot of them have rollaway beds or pull-out couches, so grad students can pile into rooms and not be too uncomfortable. So I, I shared my, my hotel room with two grad students this year, ones, and they're both super awesome people who I wouldn't have met otherwise. So it's a really great networking opportunity. It's not just great for science. Awesome. All right. Well, Sonny, thank you so much for joining us this week's episode of Astronomy Cast. Um, and uh, Pamela, I know uh, you were... Sad to not make it, but I hope this was like the second best thing to being there is having uh, Sandy report uh, in. I think, I think the second best is the fact that it wasn't just Sandy. They opened it up to new media legitimately this year, giving internet access on a secondary network that was just for them to Sandy, to Emily Lakdawalla, and... We had the microblogger thing last year too, but the network was slightly more reliable this year. Yeah. So awesome. So... Thank you so much for being part of, of our community and bringing all of this to us. All right, and then if you discover something new out there or zap an asteroid, uh, we'll have you back. Yeah. And when, and when, you're, uh, and when you're, your new uh, sailing mission is, uh, is officially launched and you're the yeah. primary investigator, we'll have you back to talk. In all right. uh, 26 years, Fraser, in 26 years. 26 years. <laughs> all right, well, thanks a lot, Sonny. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you. Okay, don't go anywhere. And we have nothing to shut off this week. I know. We just let's just keep rolling. So, Preston, you can just cut that. Um, let me just quickly look and see if there's any questions. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is so great that it's not live. Uh, it is live. It is well, live. It's kind of live, but it's going to get edited later. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Barely. So I'm uh, not going to sound like a total blithering idiot who doesn't know anything about the depths of seas on Titan. No, yeah, that, no, that, that part will get trimmed. 
but it'll when still. When they ask me that in my general exam, I'll be like, boom. <laughs> Um, okay, so here we go. So uh, number, oh, I always forget, 100 billion and one asks, what is the biggest earthquake they've detected on Mars, if any? Anyone? Uh, it's mostly seismically stable. Yeah. Um, okay, Lance INTJ, uh, he wanted us to talk about the ringed asteroid, but that I know that wasn't announced at LPSC, right? You should, so. That was not at LPSC, and what you should do is you should get Alex Parker on here to talk about it, because he's great. Or Michelle Bannister. But the it was discovered, or announced, just just. It was week. announced after LPSC, but it had been discovered a while ago through occultations. So what happens is that you have a bright star... You have a bright star. You have a bright star. And then your asteroid passes in front of it. And if it's just a solid body, it's just going to block out the light from the star. And then as it passes by, the star will come back on. But if your asteroid has rings, first of all, you'll see the asteroid block the star. Then you'll see the ring block the star. Then another ring block the star. And so and you'll then have they a saw that on both sides, right? They like saw that on meeting. both sides. So if you see it on one side, maybe you're like, oh, maybe it's a moon, maybe it's instrumental stuff. But this is how they discovered the rings of Uranus. A professor that I worked for at MIT, his name's Jim Elliott. Uh, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. Because he's such a meticulous individual, he starts running his data recorders a long time before the asteroid or the planet will pass in front of the star. And because he was started so early, they actually saw the star wink out before Uranus passed it and then after. And they found that the, the winks weren't evenly spaced and so that the rings of Uranus actually are elliptical. They're not perfectly circular around Uranus. And so the same thing would work for the... I, I'm pretty sure these... I'm not, I actually don't know how circular these rings are around this asteroid. But it's going to be very cool to see how this um, shapes our understanding of rings in the solar system. And our predictions for whether or not Pluto has rings when New Horizons gets there next year. Um, Jim LeGraff asks, would we have a better chance of detecting Earth-bound asteroids with a big radio telescope in a crater on the moon? Um, yeah, sure. Let's let's do it. Let's build How's it. How's that coming? Yeah. Let's start fundraising. Um, I guess but you specifically, would... I mean, the moon is great because what? There's no atmosphere. There's it's radio atmosphere. quiet. It's radio quiet. And right. there's no atmosphere, so it's really dry. So you can go up to higher frequencies. So you can see higher resolution on these asteroids. Um, just construction, maintenance might be a bit of a pain. But yes, if you put radio on the moon, on the other side of the moon, you are radio quiet and life is great. Uh, Michael Jobin says, she is so cool. That is all. Um, moving on. Uh, let's see. Okay, there was one more that I wanted to get, and then and then we're gonna let you go because I know you got to roll. Um, okay, right. Uh, Rachel Prozo says, "Do we know about winds or wind speeds on Titan? Do these contribute to the waves, or is it mainly gravitational pull from Saturn?" I would defer that to Sarah Horst. Let me look that up. Is there wind? Sarah Horst was on my calendar just two months ago. Um, New view of Titans, strong winds. Um, why does the space.com come up first? Um, winds on Titan can go up to 270 miles per hour. Yikes. And those are, those are really high above the surface. And, and then on the, near the surface, um, no more than a few feet per second. Right. So, so winds are pretty weak on the surface. And let's look at. Um, nope. Um, Fra uh, Fraser nice. looks pretty tan. Is another question. Yes. It's been sunny here. It's been so great. Um, you and your people in your tans. Uh, yeah. I've been. I. I mm. uh, let's see here. So. It's all right. You don't have yeah, to. Yes, so I think the tides would be. So the waves. Waves are beyond the scope, but there's some discussion about whether there are actually waves on the seas of Titan. So I don't feel like I'm qualified to answer that question. And the fact that it's so contentious means I'm just not going to go there. That would be so surreal to see 
you know, methane from methane waves. Methane waves with a wind blowing on the surface. A gentle of the breeze, a gentle zephyr. Yeah. On the Kraken Mare of Titan. I love it. All right, cool. Well, let's. We're gonna let you run. I know you gotta run onto something else, Sandy. So again, it was a total pleasure to have you join us here for this uh, episode of Astronomy Cast. We thank you for taking the time out of your awesome tour at LPI. And uh, and like I said, at some point, if something new and exciting happens, can we can we nag you back on? Absolutely. Uh, after April seventh, my life should be a little calmer. Excellent. No, it won't. So busy forever from here on out. When you get the mission, I that's it. Twenty six years of solid work. Yeah, well, I know who I'm going to have on my outreach team. <laughs> right. right. Um, Fraser is part of team team astronomer sailor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So, uh, so for those of you who are like watching this now, so we're going to wrap this up, and then we're going to start up the next episode, and that's going to be two forty Werner von Braun. Um, and we'll do that episode, and so that's going to start at three o'clock. So there will be Pacific time. There will be a new event, and so feel free to sort of jump in on that one, and we'll start that episode up and and get rolling with it. So I apologize for all the time switcheroo, uh, but uh, we sort of had to rearrange for various people's schedules. I so I instigated out chaos. there. Yeah, yeah. Really? There's like a deer right out your window. <laughs> Let's see. Hold on. No, it's over here. Um, there, there it is. is. Oh, it's so cool. That's kind of awesome. It's just like being home <laughs> in California. Puerto Rico does not have large mammals that are right. not cats, dogs, or humans. Right. Or horses. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in uh, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Sounds great. Bye. Bye-bye.